Yo, easy. What's up, guys? My name is Evan Duvall. This is Easy Does It. Thank you for joining us. That's why we, we host all those parties. Oh. All right, man. You ready? Yeah, bro. Let's do it. Let's do it. What's up, guys? How's everybody doing? Feeling good? Hey. All right. Well, we're here with Garen Jones. Super excited about this episode. It's been uh, an interesting journey to, to, for both of us to get here tonight and start you came on. So I want to thank you, first of all, for taking the time out of your day and, and being here with us. And um, yeah, it's, I'm just really excited to get into your story and, and uh, truly just leave inspired and, and um, get to know you a little bit better. I've been waiting for this moment. Man, I, you're one of the first people I met yeah. when we first moved here yeah. almost this date. Straight up. Last year. I was like, yeah. who's that guy? Yeah. And I even messaged you on a DM. I was yeah. like, man, thank you for showing up. And you were like, welcome to the community. No and doubt. it's almost a year to that date. Mm -hmm. We're probably two days off. And now we're sitting in a chair sharing each other's stories. Yeah, I mean, so that day um, we were at a friend's house doing yoga. It's this beautiful property in Westlake. And, and um, I remember seeing Garen like – well, we, it was both my first day there and your first day. You know, you just moved to Austin, I think, the day prior, I want to say. A couple and of days prior, A couple yeah. days, yeah. It was just like we moved to Austin this week, and it was just like dropped right in um, to this, you know, beautiful moment in time where the new people were standing up and introducing themselves. And, and uh, you know, I stood up and shared a little bit and uh, just kind of spoke quickly about – you know, how I could see the initiative a lot of people were taking. Um, and, you know, a lot of us were feeling called to, to serve the community in Austin in some way. And, and, you know, what I spoke about that day was basically just, you know, all of us coming here to Austin are, you know, meant to do just that. We all need to serve the community and, and stand up and, and use our voices. And uh, I remember Garen you know, standing up with his wife, Blair, and just being like, well, we just moved here, you know, this week. And, you know, I could just tell that they were, it looked like y'all were home. And um, what was interesting was, you know, I was sitting there and I I was watching you, I was looking at you, and I was like, I'm going to work with that guy. I knew nothing about you. I knew nothing. I was like, I'm going to do something with him. I don't know what it is, but I know I'm going to work with him in some mm -hmm. capacity. And... You know, I was just like, you know, waiting for the right time to come back around and get you here. And now that we're we're leveling up every single time, every single week, and and uh, just so stoked that you you know came on. And I think uh, there's be a lot of value in this conversation tonight. Yeah, I agree. And the cool thing is, is uh, our mutual friend Jerica. Yeah, she's, she's one of the first people that I met. And yeah, I remember her saying she was like, "Hey." I'm about to do this in studio podcast. I was like, I never heard of that. I'm not, there's yeah, well, like going to be an audience. Yeah. She showed me the pictures. I was like, yo, if yeah. I would have known something like that, I would have done that. That's dope. For sure. I never knew that it was you. Yeah. Full circle. Until you reached out to me a few weeks ago. And I was yeah. like, oh, wait. I saw this. Yeah. So the fact that All we like both kind of manifested this moment, I, I'm, I'm really excited. And I acknowledge you for creating a platform for stories like mm. mine and yours to have wings so that other people can know what's possible. Sure. Yeah. I think it's the single most important thing that we can do is just, you know, take the time to, to truly listen um, to people's stories and, and care enough to, to start to take down, you know, these boundaries that we create um, and assumptions that we, you know, create in our minds mostly because of survival instincts whatever it may be um, that separate us and when we can do enough work internally to where we acknowledge that voice and and care to take the time and create the space where we listen to someone and and don't just apply our experiences that's where real connection yeah. happens um, on a human level and you know it's getting more important than ever and, um, you know, that takes, that takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of, um, 
you know, different turns in life to, to come to that point. And, um, you know, I feel fortunate that, you know, I've, I've recognized this at a younger age and can act on that. And, you know, it was definitely wasn't the easy road. And, and, um, you know, that's where I, I see a lot of parallels, the more and more I've, I've looked into your story, um, you know, preparing for this episode and just wanting to get to know you a little bit more and, and honestly look for those gaps and what you've shared yet and see where we can fish. But, um, you know, I think something I'm seeing in your story was there were a lot of hard lessons and, you know, a very pivotal moment in your life where you said, fuck this, I'm done, you know, I'm, I'm done yeah. being the victim here. <laughs> I'm going to take control of my life. And, you know, you weren't even necessarily playing the victim. It was just a product of your surroundings, it Absolutely. seems like. And then you realized that wasn't working even still. And I recognize that in my own story and every day since, you know, <laughs> but it's that, that acknowledgement and saying, okay, well, I'm aware of the patterns that have led to the bad shit in my life, right? Okay, now that I'm aware of them, what can I do differently to not get that same effect? And yeah, so let's just, let's just drop in and get into your story. And so for those of you, for those of them that don't know your story and uh, just open it up from there. How far back do you want me to go? Cause we could talk yeah, I for think, days. I mean, I'm, I'm excited. You're a Texas boy. You know, I think uh, just where you grew up, I think, you know, it's, uh, it's cool to hear where someone's from, how they grew yeah. up and, and then, you know, moving forward, you know, there's there's a lot of different chapters. So let's just Got it. touch on them broad scope. So kind of bullet point kind of story. I was born in Third Ward, Texas. Uh, moved to Houston, moved around maybe like six or seven times. So there was no stability in yeah. anything. Yeah. And uh, we ended up in Missouri City, Texas. It's right outside of close to Sugar Land. Mm -hmm. And I graduated high school from there. All through there... The product, I was a product of whatever environment I was around, but the environment I was around was the kids that were always chasing after girls or breaking into cars, breaking into homes, things like that. It was never anything that I thought of of my own, but the people that I hung out with, that's just what they did. So yeah. I naturally did whatever they did. Sure. And I just mentally, I never stopped. Mm -hmm. You know, my my brother was at the time was too cool to hang out with me, and my mom. Granted, she did the best she could with what she knew. Mm -hmm. I know that now, but as a little kid, I'm like, you don't love me. You never say you love me. Yeah. She would make food for me and my brother, and then go straight to her room. Mm -hmm. And all I wanted to ever do was eat dinner at the dinner table. Cause my other friends would have supper time right? and I'm just like, man, I wish I had that. That must mean my mom doesn't love me. So I went my whole life not feeling love for my mom. My dad was a drug dealer. He was murdered when I was 12 years old. I blamed it on myself. So there yeah. was a lot of things that happened early on that, that was integrated in my childhood programming. Mm -hmm. And I always like to say that adults are deteriorated children. Yeah. Somebody says, oh, I have money problems or I have sex problems or I have whatever problems. I start asking questions to take it all the way back to who had sex problems or who touched you as a little kid or what kind of language did you hear around worthiness or money. At My mom used to always say, oh, we can't afford it. Sure. We don't have no money. You tell that to a little kid, that becomes the running narrative you. of... No matter how much money you have, I can't afford it. I'm still broke mentally. Mm -hmm. So that's the environment I grew up in, going in and out of juvenile, in and out of jail for the same things that I was doing when I was seven, eight, nine years old. And there was a moment when I left Texas and everybody thought I was the craziest person. And I remember I used to say, I feel like I'm not supposed to be here. And every time I would say that around people, they're mm -hmm. like, are you kidding me? Your family's here. You got a girlfriend here. You got a, whatever they say to keep you inside, inside of that little cycle. Sure. And this little voice was tugging at me all the time. Move away. Mm -hmm. Move away. 
And there was a time where I could have gone to, I pretty much got myself together. I was doing good in school. I got a track scholarship. I could have gone to any school I pretty much wanted to. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'm leaving Texas. Mm. I had a girlfriend and my girlfriend was like, you're what? So that became the first hurdle. My grandmother, she was like, you'll never make it if you leave Texas. Yeah. And my grandmother was my favorite person, my, my favorite mentor. Right. Second hurdle. My friends doubted me. All your family are friends here. You're just going to leave? And, I, and one, it was the first time in my life I said, you know what? They'll be here when I come back. Mm -hmm. And I ended up leaving and I went to Kansas. That was so weird because yeah. I was like, I, I need to leave and go to someplace completely different. I went to Kansas and it was damn near the same exact thing. Yeah. Tornadoes in Texas, tornadoes in Kansas. Yep. Slow talking people in Texas, slow talking people in Kansas. <laughs> and I'm like, yo, this is the same city. Mm -hmm. I need to go somewhere where nobody knows my name. Nobody knows anything about me that is completely different than anywhere I'd ever grown up. Start over. I'm going to go to California. Yeah. I, I'm a movie star, that whole thing. Yeah. And against everyone's will, I left and went to California. Everybody doubted me, but I've always kind of been the black sheep of my family. Everybody doubted me. There's something inside of me, though. Whenever anybody doubted me, I went to like prove it. I'm going to prove you wrong. Mm. So I went to California on a mission to prove everybody who'd ever doubted me wrong. Yeah. So here starts the hardest time of my life. And I had to share this makeup because most people never leave. They're afraid to leave home. They're mm -hmm. afraid to leave the comfort environment. But the bird will never know how far it can fly until it leaves the nest. Sure. It's the nest of your comfort zone. So me actually leaving was the greatest decision I ever m made because it was the hardest time I ever had. Yeah, I mean, that, that was a big pivotal moment in my life too. And you know, what I'm hearing in that was just that you're seeking something, you're seeking more perspective that was different than just I what you were brought up in. I didn't know what to call it, mm -hmm. but I knew that here wasn't it. Sure, yeah. It wasn't it. just gotta get out. And uh, yeah, I felt the same way, like, going through high school and getting my eyes like set on the military as my way out was so drastically different. Not coming from a military family, not going to play sports, you know, not going to college with all my friends. It seemed like this drastic decision, but like in my heart, I knew that it was the right thing. You know, that was the, my first taste of intuition was being steered away from the patterns that everybody I knew that I grew up around was doing. And, um, I was so thankful that I, I trusted that against everyone's wishes, you know, and, and, you know, I was in for it as well. There's a lot of hard lessons down that road. Um, but you know, I was so happy to take that step. And that was like the first like empowering moment in my life where, you know, I, I would find rock bottom. I would find my ass just leveled and I'd be able to, you know, pick myself back up. I couldn't come running home to mom and dad mm -hmm. or ask for cash or whatever. It was just like, I had to figure it out. And, uh, super thankful for that, taking that chance. And, you know, something also resonated was you saying that, you know, a lot of people were telling you that you were going to fail. And even your grandma saying, you know, mm. that, you that know, one's dumb. yeah. And it's like, those are people that you really trust and you need their support. And, you know, I think that's, you know, truly anybody in this world that's really, you know, I don't know, focusing on how much they affect other people. It's super important to be aware of, you know, that people are watching, people are listening and your words carry weight, especially in family dynamics or, you know, friends dynamics. And it's really important that we help each other expand and want the best for each other. Because, again, it's it's instinctual for people to want someone they love just around, you know, and they'll almost do anything it takes to keep them around. Yeah. Just because it's they're used to it. And I, I wanted to add, it, it's really cool that you brought that up, because when my grandmother said that 
my mom, who never took up for me, Mm -hmm. told her mom, my grandmother, don't you ever tell my son what he can and cannot do. Good. That was the thing. Yeah. When when I felt like somebody had my back. Yeah. I said I'm gonna go and do whatever I need to do. Mm-hmm. And I'd never heard my mom do that. Yeah. So, I just want to wrap up the the rest of the story. So I leave for California. It's difficult. I'm. My thing was it's like I just gotta figure it out. It, you know, I'm I'm there. I lose. I, I, I fell out with my roommate. Then I was like, man, well, I know this pretty girl. So I start sleeping around and sleeping with all these women. Mm. And I just, I just, I didn't have value in myself. So I didn't know Mm. the opportunities that I had to build up those queen, build up those queens and the women that I was coming in contact. I had no idea because I didn't love myself. So I was just trying to fill an empty void. So I went that whole time just on this journey of just being numb with emotions being lost Mm. in Hollywood, doing the modeling thing, doing the acting thing, but nothing was ever fulfilling. Sure. Then there was a moment where I had gotten a record deal with Ludacris, was signed to DTP, was on MTV, was in the studio with 2 Chains and Chingy and doing all these things that I thought these were it, and it wasn't because when I would see the people behind the scenes, they were all stressed out. They yeah. were, so many people were snorting coke. So many people were drinking their lives away. I'm like, wait. They're hiding. I thought this was success. Mm-hmm. And then my friend put a bullet into his brain who had the cars, the money, the girls, the mansions. And what I found out is he had everything but his own life. So maybe mm. I need to rethink what success what is. What you're building here, yeah. But unfortunately for me, my life was already heading that way and I couldn't mm-hmm. stop. Yeah, it was already. So I lived in my car motion. for two and a half years, $250,000 in debt, mom dying in the hospital. I'm putting on weight like I tried to kill myself twice, failed at that. It was dark. It was depressed. It was, mm-hmm. I was so depressed and my ego would not let me go back home because I said, if I ever come back home, I failed and I just toughed it out. Yeah. And 343 August 2011, I just remember going, okay, I'm tired of fighting. I don't want to fight anymore. I want to be healthy. I want to be happy. I want to be surrounded by nothing but positive people. Mm. I just want to inspire people and I want to make a bunch of money, but I want the money to represent something that I passionately believe in that I would do for free. That's clarity. Here's where it all changed. Yeah. Cause somebody's like, well, how do you go from $250,000 in debt? Five years later, you're a multimillionaire. Mm-hmm. What did you do? What's the work? No, not the work. Follow the mentality. I've always been passionate but I never knew where to put the energy. So I put it in women. I put it in selling drugs. I put it in running the streets. I put it in negativity. I put it in insecurity and I was successful at all of it. Mm -hmm. But then when I finally, for the first time in my life, yelled out what I just shared with Mm -hmm. you a week later, I meet a homeless guy who asked me for money. And I said, you have more money than me. He said, change your mindset, change your life. And it was that moment Mm. where it felt like I had a conscious interrupt and it stopped my whole life in its tracks and made me think kind of like that movie Sixth Sense where the the guy, he didn't know he was dead and then he saw all the scenes. Mm -hmm. I saw every moment in my life in a flash. I was like, maybe it was all a lie because of the way that I think. Mm. That moment I started doing the opposite of everything I would normally do in areas of my life where I wasn't happy. And it's been 10 years from that date. So the homeless guy now has several homes. Mm -hmm. The guy who had issues with sex and sexual trauma now has the most incredible sex and is in a committed marriage (laughs) with a beautiful and powerful and successful woman. And we just had a baby nine weeks ago. Congrats, brother. Thank you so much. And the guy who never felt worthy of success now teaches and trains all over the world people on how to 
cultivate and uncover the things that they're allowing to block their lives from experiencing their fullest expression, which leads to abundance. Sure. Yeah, man. Something that hit me. I remember a a point in my life as well that, you know, I, I went so far down a road because of ego, pride and desire were my three biggest, you know, strengths that led me down this path. Right. And, you know, I went so far that I got to a point where I realized that I was going to have to change the way I did everything, everything, the way I made decisions, the way I spoke to people, the way I, you know, showed myself love, everything. And I had no idea how to do it. I'd been going down, you know, this road where, you know, I, I joined the Navy to be a SEAL, went to SEAL training, paralyzed my leg, couldn't walk, couldn't sleep. At SEAL training? Yeah. Wow. My second hell week. And and um, I had radiating nerve pain down my left leg so bad that, you know, if you would have told me to, you could cut off my leg, take away the pain, I would just told you to take it. Like, it, I couldn't sleep. I was stressed. My nervous system was just amped. And still my ego was strong enough to where I said, you know what, I'm going to go back. Still going to be a SEAL. So I just started running and squatting again, even though my left leg was, I call it lagging, but it just wasn't working neurologically. And so I did that for like another year where I was just training on that leg and, um, you know, still not sleeping. I slept on a yoga mat. There's just a Lululemon yoga mat on my floor because I couldn't sleep in a bed or I'd have nerve pain the whole next day. And uh, so I did that for about a year. And then just worked my ass off in the Navy to go back, got picked up for explosive ordnance disposal school, went to that, chased that dream, failed out of there for no reason. Like captain basically told me that his intuition was telling me that I was done. At the time I didn't respect that. Mm -hmm. I thought it was bullshit. I was like, your intuition's telling you I'm done. Like, fuck you, man. Like I was speechless. Now looking back, I have so much more respect for intuition and, I, I've, I've sat with that. It's like, I appreciate that, you know, he that was his word. And, um, anyway, I went, I had some of the instructors kind of like pull me in and look out for me and try to get me a green beret contract, you know, which was my original goal at like 17 was to go special forces. And, uh, I went through a few meetings there and, um, and then they slid me a 12 year contract across the desk. And that was the moment where I was like, why am I about to sign away 12 years of my life? I don't know where I'm going to be in 12 years. Like, why? And I just felt so much clarity that, like, I was chasing a dream to prove something, to prove I could. And the world was showing me every sign that this path was over. There's another route. There's another way to go about being a warrior. And and I had no idea where I was going to start, but I knew this wasn't it. And I knew that this wasn't serving me in any capacity. Physically, I was a wreck. Emotionally, I was just cold. Mentally, I was only focused on one thing, you know. And and uh, so that you know that was three years ago where I just started over flat. And I said, well, you know, me thinking I know my path isn't working. I'm gonna start listening and and following my heart again and trusting my intuition and. I think I went down that road following my intuition as well. And I had to learn every lesson on that road for the exact reason I'm sitting here now. It's just that awareness. Mm. Um, Super thankful for that. And, um, you know, I think, you know, something that's interesting as well is, you know, hearing that, you know, you lived in your car where you're $250,000 in debt and you were also pursuing this music career in LA where you know people might look at you in the music videos and and doing your thing and say like that guy's got it all you know and it's it's mostly a facade cuz you're just like you're homeless and you're not doing well physically and mentally and emotionally and like all of these things but it's just interesting to see that in our culture where we jump to conclusions on anything and everything about who someone is and how they got where they are. And like for you, that was just the beginning, man. Like it was just, you were just getting started, you know, and to see you now fully embodied and empowered and serving others is 
fucking amazing. Um, and, uh, you know, I think I kind of want to remove the veil of like what this is and what this looks like, you know, it's, I, I got out of the military last year, um, August, 2020, I, was released from the Navy October 1st, 2020. Um, got my job, like, working at uh, On It Gym. I was just kind of, like, fell into it. And it was dream job at that point. And uh, started working over there for, like, six months and just, like, you know, really was just, like, burning out over and over and over, and I didn't know why. And um, that's when I was started focusing more on the podcast. And then I had two full-blown careers, and that's when I really started to feel burnout and uh, realized that I had to I had to pick my career and build something rather than just, even if it was something I enjoyed, just working for somebody else. And um, so I gave myself 30 days to figure out how I could make an income off of podcasting um, and let on it know that I was going to leave in 30 days. I had no plan, ended my lease, moved into my van, um, again, just sleeping on the floor in my van, didn't have a bed or anything built. And, um, you know, that's where I was for six months. And, um, it was just such a trip to like give up all comforts in order to choose myself and, mm. and pick service over everything. And that's what I wanted to drop into you now is cause I realized that I've valued serving others more than serving myself every day of the week my whole life and um i'm realizing that's no longer serving me and to see how you know you took that and you flipped that switch from saying like i'm gonna chase all of my dreams i'm gonna make them happen and then you still had the the, the fortitude and awareness to be like well this isn't it either i need to come back to service and so i think our two paths a line in this moment for exactly that reason is to you know just kind of find and talk about what the what the in between of just yeah. like all in where like you give all of your time and energy away because you're so hourly focused on others or you're overly consumed with yourself and you, the world starts to kind of like redirect you so I, I think it's an interesting dynamic to drop into yeah so this is something I run into with a lot of people, a lot of people in Austin, a lot of people in the world that they've got all this stuff to give and they mm -hmm. got run all these programs. And I just like, I don't, where's the abundance? Where's the money? Yeah. Like I just give and I give and I give and I give. And it's been like two years just on output. Yeah. But here's the thing. People think, that the time limit here on earth is the same time limit that operates in the spiritual realm. Mm -hmm. Not even close. <laughs> not even, it's not even a fraction of close. doesn't even have words. It's a, it's a resonant frequency. So people's like, man, it's not happening. It's not, it's not happening. But you don't go up to the lady who's just been impregnated. It was like, baby, come. Baby, come. No, there's yeah. a process. Sure. And no matter what the process, unless you dig it, but you're going to kill the baby. Mm -hmm. So you must respect the process. Yeah. But the process is the process. Yeah. And what I find people is they operate from human time. Mm -hmm. And they allow the human time to dictate the spiritual realm and processes and all the things that could be working in your their favor and every single time you say but it's not he's like oh well then you met you this was about yourself mm. so it always comes back yeah it's like no but it's really about others it's really about but if you say it's not happening in time whose time sure your time yeah i had a mentor mention that to me you know probably four or five months ago like midway through this process and I've shared it a lot since, you know, it's brought me a lot of comfort, you know, thinking about just the perspective of that, like why rush it? You know, it's, um, I think I was just a little burnt out. I was doing a ton of events. You know, I've, 
I've done 65 events since July, just like output, output, output. And I was just exhausted. And I talked to a friend about it and he was just like, man, you know, like these are going to se- seem like simpler times, you know, here in a few years, you're going to miss this, that where you're carrying gear in and out of clubs and like setting up everything by yourself. And, and, uh, that added so much perspective of, you know, I've shared that with musicians and artists that I see just grinding, like just putting in work. And it's like, man, like these are going to be simpler times one day and you're going to look back and cherish these moments. And, and that was something I, I heard in your story that really, really caught my ear was, you know, that, you know, well, I think backing up a little bit when you did time, you know, I think that's a big portion of your story and, and, um, I'll let you touch in on that. But what I heard when you came out was that you had this calling that you knew you were going to do big shit with your life and you knew that you were just going to go all in on it. And and it just kept knocking you down. It was, it was tough, like just getting leveled, right? And you kept moving forward. And, you know, I know that well. It's like you just life comes at you hard, but there has to be a reason, right? And there's a lot of people in this room that have learned just hard, hard lessons. And quite honestly, a lot of us have probably asked, why me at yeah. some point, right? That, it's just natural. That happened. I used to be like, God. Yeah. Why does it feel like I'm living 15, yeah. 20 different people's yeah. lives? Yeah. I've been a stripper. I've been a drug dealer. I've been an athlete. Yeah. I've been a womanizer. I've been a freaking um, uh, sh- a straight D student. Mm-hmm. I've been so many different variations. But then when you connect the dots looking backwards, you got to understand, we're not. Uh, we, if you think about, oh, it's not happening this time. How... The, the the spiritual realm time works is kind of like a um a movie director mm-hmm. they don't shoot first scene second scene third scene it's like last scene first first scene in the middle it, it it that's how it operates but if you look at pan out and look at the body of work yeah and then you look at the caliber of people who follow me mm-hmm. the caliber of people who i speak for when i go to these jails in these prisons, Mm -hmm. in these juveniles. Yeah. And I attract people who've been a part of gangs, people who, who've uh, been, uh, you know, I I was molested by my cousin when I was, uh, what is it, nine years old. People who've been molested, people who've been raped. All of them are fractions of who I was. Mm -hmm. And then I say, oh. There's a reason. Wait a second. People only listen to who they can relate to. Mm-hmm. So now when I'm on stage in front of 20,000 people yeah, and people are like, yo, I felt like you were speaking to me. That's because I was. Yeah. Because yeah, I, I attract, I attract different variations of me. Yeah. People who have daddy issues, mama issues and everything, money issues. Mm-hmm. And if I overcame it, now I become a bridge and an opening for some for me to share my story and somebody say me too if he can do it so can i well i think that's the the beauty of sharing you know is that we we do remove those assumptions of you know what people are about or where they've been and who they are you know and by going through something it's like chris like we spoke about as you came in saying you know that there's one level of just healing yourself and and feeling whole and being comfortable and that's i mean that's amazing that's that's one mile marker in life and the next is how can you use what you've learned to serve others and share and that's gonna you know remove a lot more comfort you know and expose you more and and um but you know i've I've spoke about this with godsy before where we you know just really got into you know that's the point that's the reason we go through hard shit is to share it and make other people feel, you know, less alone. Well, here's the caveat though. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't think their story matters Mm -hmm. and there's a lot that they won't share. Right. Not realizing my whole yeah. everything, my whole business, everything. Before I was this, oh, I'm a trainer and that was my story. Mm-hmm. But deep down inside, 
I was living in my car. I was sleeping on bubble wrap in an abandoned building. And all this was happening while I was out fronting. Yeah. Most people are fronting. Front. Yeah. So here's yeah. the here's it's the thing. Depth. My spiritual advisor, Monica Zanz, had me write a letter from my big self to my little self, mm. apologizing for leaving little Garen. Because there was a lot of, from my past I was ashamed of, ashamed of where I was from, ashamed of like things that happened to me with, between me and my father, things like that, that yeah. I ran away from to go to L.A. Mm -hmm. She told me to write a letter from my big self to my little self, apologizing for leaving him. Mm -hmm. And then when you're done with that letter, letter switch to your non-dominant hand, which activates a different part of your brain. And I wrote a letter from Little Garen wow. to Big Garen. Oh my God. It, all of a sudden, all these things that I had suppressed and stuffed down for years that I completely forgot about all came out. F you. You left me. You this. You that. And I just allowed myself to truly feel those suppressed emotions and let it all out and as soon as i was done with that letter i was like i've deprived myself from the full range of spectrum of me mm -hmm. i've been operating as half and in that moment i said i will never live another day where someone doesn't know the authentic version of me and that's when i went online and it was the scariest moment of my life i say you think you know me you have no idea. You know this, this, and this, and this, and this. You don't know I'm sleeping in my car. You don't know this. You don't know this. You don't know I've cheated on every girlfriend I've ever had. You don't know. And I just basically made myself naked. And yeah. I said, but guess what? Five years from now, I'm going to retire my mom. I'm going to put my daughter through college. I'm going to be a multimillionaire. All of it's online, literally, yeah. right now. And I put it all there. When I was done... This is when I knew what my true calling was because I never knew what it was before. The very first message I got, and I had pages of emails, and this is before I had any big following or anything. Yeah. Facebook page was private, no Instagram. I had pages of emails. First message was I put the gun down when you shared your testimony. Mm. Six message, I did not drive my car off a bridge when you shared your testimony. Something dropped inside of me and I said, I know why I'm here to be the voice of the voiceless and represent people that has been through some crazy stuff and they have nobody to relate to. I'll be that so that they can see themselves inside of me and then discover themselves inside of their own selves. But somebody's got to stand up. That's when my business opened up. I mean, when I tell you the Red Sea parted for my life, mm -hmm. I was in health and wellness. I was, man, hundreds of clients came out of nowhere, or I unblocked myself from the world and the world for the first time and me for the first time showed up as the most authentic version of myself i yeah. mean everything not front no more i let it all out so no one ever could say oh i heard no you didn't i told you mm -hmm. it's kind of like eminem in that movie eight mile yeah at the very end where he couldn't he literally talked about himself mm -hmm. where the guy couldn't say anything else there's not one thing that anyone can bring up in the world that i haven't shared and because I'm like this, all the people that are like this follow mm -hmm. and they're like, that strength. How do you do that? I'm going to buy your book. I'm going to buy your courses. Whatever you're doing, just let me, I'm going to hang on until I develop enough strength so I can be myself. Yeah, I think that's the, that's the biggest thing that I'm seeing that is getting more and more popular is that you know, vulnerability is true strength. And I, I think that is what's really shifting a lot of people um, away from, you know, protecting that image and truly just being themselves is really empowering. And you start believing in yourself. And man, I think what's so interesting to me about the way you show up just from an outside perspective is 
that these exercises you're talking about, like sitting down and writing that letter and doing that. And like, it takes a lot to sit down and do it. You know, and I think that's, I assume what's made you so successful is, you know, hearing something that can benefit at you and just doing it, you know, and I see that in your routine and, and, you know, these exercises and journal topics and whatever it is, there's so many people and myself included that like, we have a lot of resistance to doing new things and that's where you're expediting that growth and reaping the benefits of it is because you're willing to put in that work take actionable steps towards creating a better version of yourself and doing that day in and day out and we can all find things that you know work for us in that light if you just sit down and actually do it and hold yourself to it um you know i think you know how many people in the room just tell themselves they're going to start that tomorrow or they hear about something and they say oh that's that's interesting i i think i'd like to do that or i should do that and you never do it i do it all the time you know, I think Garen's a guy that sits down, he hears that, and he sits down and does it. And if I don't, my wife will hold me accountable. Yeah. <laughs> Get you a good, good wife. One. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, man, I think that's beautiful. Yeah, I'd like to, uh, I, you know, a lot of this podcast has been about, you know, what brought people back to Austin, how they're hoping to contribute, um, what they're hoping to share with the community. And um, I'd like to get into just that, you know, yeah. what, what brought you back here? What did you see in Austin? And, um, you know, what are you how are you hoping to serve the community now? Yeah, I'll tell you now, I was I was never coming back to Texas. Yeah. And here's the thing. My Still va- sense from that first inclination. Yeah. Because leaving high school when I left. I was thugging in the streets. I wasn't a thug, but I was just doing what other thugs would do, like breaking into cars and selling drugs and stuff like that. So I was thugging in the streets and I was doing a bunch of things. So my values were way, I'm 42 years young now. Me at 18 was a super hot mess. So my values were totally different. So the mention of Texas, even last year when my wife was was like, what about Austin? Mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm never moving back to Texas because the last time I thought of Texas, I had a completely different value system. I didn't value family. I didn't value community. I didn't value freedom like that because I did whatever the heaven I wanted anyways. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah, you caught that, right? <clears throat> so it was my wife's idea. She was the visionary. Yeah. She was like, this is an opportunity. And I was like, well, I like L.A., she was like, well, I don't like these taxes. Well, I was like, well, I don't live in L.A. for the taxes. I make a lot of money here. Mm-hmm. You know, even though I don't go to the beach, I just love the comfort of knowing the beach is here. Yeah. Then when COVID happened, it exposed all these things I didn't even know were ever in L.A. And I'm like, I live here. Oh, no, I'm out. And so but I wanted to be in an environment where it was culturally diverse. I wanted to see black people but I don't, I, you know, and I wanted to see white people. I wanted to see Asians. I wanted to see, but I also wanted to see success. Mm-hmm. I wanted to see thriving, progressive energy. I wanted to see younger entrepreneur, entrepreneurs and things like that. And I was like, I don't know of any other place. LA is the only place. She was like, Garen, no, it's not. <laughs> what about Austin, Texas? I was like, no, never going back to Texas yeah. ever. I came here to visit. As soon as I came to visit, that's when COVID hit. Yeah. And I and it was a ghost town. See, I was like, I told you, there's nobody here. <laughs> That's when everybody was like afraid. Yeah. But then after a while, people were like, yeah, okay, I'm coming out. back out. Yeah. So we came back again. And then we came back again. And it was just alive. I was like, oh, oh, mm-hmm. I really like this. Mm-hmm. And my values we're about family and community which i feel is the new luxury yeah i didn't know what i was going to do here but i was already doing so much big stuff in the world whether it's one-on-one coaching transformation retreats uh running workshops um you know putting out my book change your mindset change your life 
Shameless plug on Amazon. When was that released? Uh, two years ago. 2019. We've sold 42,000 copies with no ads, no nothing. I haven't wow. even pushed it. It's it's the work carrying the work. Yeah. And um, then all of a sudden I started working out with these men in the group. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was my boy Stefanos, Sifandos, mm-hmm. and um, Preston Smiles. He invited me to a garage workout with four guys. I've never had relationships with men mm-hmm. literally in my life because I've I was I was raised around men who treated women like trash and I vowed to never do that even though I kind of did in my own sexual ways. Yeah. And I just never had relationships with men. And then when I was working out with healthy men who who embodied a different kind of masculinity that i had never been exposed to i was like i don't know i'm like learning and i'm an integrator so i'll see something that i like and i'll instantly start applying yeah so i just started going to the workout more and more and more we outgrew that garage and then we went to my boy cal's house and then we outgrew his garage and he went out of town for three months and then we went partnered with on it and then we outgrew that place remember i came through one day and there's just like I was picking something up from on it. It was 90 people. And I was like running through there and they're just like, yeah, maybe plus, you know, I'm telling it, it you. seemed like 200 guys. And they said we like could only have 50. We yeah. had 90. Yeah. So we had to go take it to a park. And yeah. then these men were coming to us saying, yo, do you have anything deeper? And we were like, wait, we're very high level coaches. And, and though I never did men's work, I did work. Like mm-hmm. I support people through their stuff and support people in elevating into whatever their next level is. I was like, I can do this and I need this. Yeah. So the more and more of the desire that these men were coming for what they wanted, we were like, we already know how to do all this. Mm-hmm. So now we're launching our global platform January 18th of Empowered Brotherhood where myself, Stefano Sifandos, and Preston Smiles are the co-founders leading men and building up men and creating a new narrative of how man experiences himself mm. and how the world experiences man. Because if you look at what man has done <laughs> to this world, I'm not proud of that. Right. And I want to be a part of a new narrative so that when people think of man, it actually warms their heart. And when man thinks of man, there's no hiding. Well, that's where we started this conversation too. You know, it's just the acknowledgement that something's off, something has to change, and and doing the hard work to rewrite how you go about doing it. Yeah. You know, it's like that started as a personal journey, and you know, you learned it the hard way. I I did myself, and continue to the most times, and and uh, but yes, yeah, stepping up and and sharing that that priceless knowledge, and and you know, you're reaping the benefits of that that community as well you know just by stepping up like i always loved coaching as a personal trainer you know because i felt like there was an implied expectation of you know the way that i needed to train and carry myself and like i wanted to practice what i preached and i think that's the best position we can put ourselves in is coaching or teaching or speaking because you remind yourself of where you've been You remind yourself of what you've learned as you share your knowledge. And, you know, the more that you can, you know, revisit what you've learned in your past and and bring it up again and again, that's that's where you, you know, expand on what you can improve on um, instead of just getting caught in the same patterns. Like, you know, there are people that will live and die learning the same three lessons, if that, their entire life. You know, and it it could just be a simple one. You know, it's it's not what I'm here for. I don't think that's why a lot of y'all are what a lot of y'all are here for. It's why you're out in an environment like this, seeking more, seeking perspective, and you know, it could be you could be very well, you know, somewhere else doing, God knows what. And uh, yeah, I'm just really excited and thankful for all of y'all showing up tonight. Um, Something that Garen and I spoke about earlier this week was you know opening this up a little bit more um and getting into some crowd interaction as far as you know if anybody has something that they really want to share um or if this brought up anything specifically 
um we'd love to hear your story or a question yeah or question for either of us but yeah pick garen's brain guys it's a wealth of knowledge and and uh it's a great opportunity. So we've got a mic here. Uh, if we'll pass that out. It's a baby mic. So yeah, baby mic. Yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> <We're expecting. laughs> so you can take it off and just jump right in, dude. What's up, Garen? What's going on, brother? How are you? You can pull on it. Eh, eh, yeah, it's eh, funny. Explore Express. A little, elevate. Little, little MPB inside thing. <laughs> um, it kind of seems like you changed all aspects of your life with the same decision the same mindset the same realization I'm, I'm quite interested in how you changed your experiences with women and dating and going from just this is going to be a good one if you got a piece of paper you're going y'all going yeah. to write notes you know just like we're recording I'll, I'll check back when you're just like sleeping around mm. and you know you can you know you're just doing it because you're horny or like you you know what I mean like yeah. all the common yeah guy problems mm -hmm. and all of that it's like how did you overcome that where you were having more conscious intentional um, relationships rather than just giving into your like human primal lizard brain desires you know so one <laughs> you, you you can't change what you're not aware of right so I didn't even know what I was trying to change I was just like I have this desire act on it right. I didn't know that there was anything wrong with that. Um, I didn't have a relationship with my daughter. My daughter's she just turned 20 December 6th. And it was on and off. And no matter how much I changed, I could be so powerful in the world. But any time I would get on, I'd try to get on a call with her, I would turn into this shriveled little wimp. And I was like, I hope she knows that I changed. And then I would get on a call and she, I would just allow myself to be crushed because of shame, of not showing up. Of, see, I know now, I didn't know back then, of all of the times I could have shown up and been the king of an example for her, but I didn't know, didn't even have that in my, that example in my mom or my dad. So how am I supposed to know? I did a 10 day silent retreat and then I was done. And this guy named Steve walked over to me. He was like, you're a good looking guy. I thought he was hitting on me. He was like, you're a good looking guy. It's safe to say you can get any girl you want. I was like, yep. He said, get a date with your daughter. She's a girl. Oh my God, I've never ever tried to pursue my daughter. Here's tricky. I don't know who you believe in, but I believe in God. This My God be tricky. <laughs> Yo, so I never tried to pursue my daughter. And so I said, you know what? Instead of being this weak person, funny enough, every single person she was dating was a mirror image of who I was. So I was weak. I was like, man, that dude's a, little, a wimp. Not knowing that I appeared like that to her because she had no other example. And I said, pay attention to my words. I am the most powerful representation of who she will marry one day. But at this time, she wasn't talking to me, nothing. But by claiming those words, I no longer was living in the shame of my past. I am the most powerful representation of who she will marry one day. It was like this universal spiritual puppet master having me think these different thoughts because I have no idea what that is. But all of a sudden, I said, hey, baby, wear your best outfit. Get magazine ready. I'm going to take you to the best restaurant on, in town. And we're going to go have an incredible dinner. Don't ask questions. I had never spoken like that to my daughter ever. Her mom calls me five minutes later. She goes, what did you tell my daughter? I said, why? She like, I've never seen her so giddy in my life. And she was like, she's like putting on clothes and taking off clothes and everything. And so my goal was to pursue my daughter, take her out on a date and what I found out that all women, 
I mean, and I've spoken, literally spoken, in over 70 countries all over the world. It don't matter if you speak English or not. What I've gotten from women, they want to feel seen, heard, not when you just hear their words, but when you hear the feelings under the words that might not even make sense to the words that, that you're saying. Being seen, being heard, and being acknowledged. I never came from that approach to my daughter. But that night was the very first night. And then the people right next to us said, your girlfriend, you and your girlfriend look so cute. Because, see, I don't look like a 42-year-old man. Yeah, shit, man. So, <laughs> so I was like, yo, I'm pursuing my daughter. And here's where it's getting crazy. To answer your question, somehow it found a way to find a woman and the only woman I have ever, ever let that close to my heart, I didn't even let my mom, was my daughter. And then my daughter starts. I came back from a five-day trip in Hong Kong. She was like, what do you want to eat? And I've never had anybody ask me that. I was like, why? She was like, you've been working really hard, and I just want to take care of you. And I was like, oh, whatever this is. I want more of it. <laughs> and I told her mom. So I was teaching her, and I didn't know that, but she was also teaching me what I wanted in a woman. Not just cooking, but the fact that, you know, I've been working really hard, and you got my back. And she started doing all these things. I was like, yo, I would want that in a woman. I would want that in a woman. I would want that in And when I proved whatever my work was that I was deserving of a woman and I passed that test so funny that's right when I met my wife and when I met her trust me our first date I say you're gonna be the mother of our children I'm gonna marry you one day because I already knew what I wanted and a lot of times Men don't really know what they want, and you can't hit a target you don't have. So I want this, 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 I want this. I made a list of 62 attributes, and my wife has all 62 of them. <laughs> Knows God, makes her own money, masculine, and can easily slip into her feminine, feminine has like literally loves pets, loves animals. Um, she loves healthy, active lifestyle, loves reading books. And I just made this list. I was like, man, whoever this person is, that's it. I will lay down the line. I will shut everybody out. So when that happened, I knew right then I am committed and I am committed. And that level of committed demagnetized any other desire I had. And sure, Things come up, but it's too strong in my relationship. It's I'm too grounded in the foundation of my commitment, and it demagnetizes all these other things. So now when a pretty girl goes by, I'm like, oh, I can just observe it. <laughs> and it literally has no magnetism because my wife is exactly what I want, and I'm so clear. And when you know what you want, like you know your own name, it's easy to make that decision. Oh, yeah, man, I love that. So just to kind of go full circle and tie all that up, you're saying treat women the way that you would be the man that you would want your daughter to date first off kind of thing. Because no, then, you got to understand yeah. that woman is somebody's daughter. Right. So if you held women in a reverence that you are the example, because a lot of my women friends... Not all of them, but a lot of my personal women friends, they got daddy issues. And a lot of times they date their dad over and over and over and over and over. And you might be their dad unless you show them something different. So if you treat them with the reverence of, I'm the most powerful representation of who you will marry one day, you might be the person getting married. Right. Cool. Also, and then like know what you want, get super clear on it, basically. Dope. Thanks. 
yeah. I think I had a few takeaways from that I I got is, you know, approach people and pay attention to who they are and what they're worth in their own being, not apply what you need or what you want out of them, right? Don't see yourself in other people. Um, try to see people for who they are and what they're worth and, and let that be enough, you know? Not necessarily fill ourselves with validation through other people. You know, those are just vessels. It's not a lot of depth there. And you know? and one thing I wanted to add, we, we all have sexual desires. I'm not saying it. We don't have. We all have it. We all have it. That is a that's human nature. The mo, one of the most powerful energies in the world is the desire for sex. Like whatever causes that. But what's even more double the power is sexual transmutation. When you can take that energy and put it towards something that you're creating. How do you do that? I've tried. I've tried. I've tried. I just like I'm horny. I'm gonna go. No, no, no. <laughs> but here's here's the thing. It's a practice. Yeah, yeah. You ask me how did I run 60 miles over a mountain to someone who's never run a mile before? How do you do that? I practiced right. every day, and it was practice. Sometimes I slipped up. But as, as long as I was working towards a goal, mm -hmm. I'm not going to let this take me out. But if it does, I'm getting back on the horse and not shaming myself for messing up as long as I'm working towards something because you can't hit a target you don't have. Hmm. This is my chief aim. If you slip up, okay, got it. What's the lesson that I learned? Get back on the horse. Sick. It's awesome. And like, do you recommend like, okay, I, I love the idea of transmuting sexual energy into something positive and creative. I think that's super powerful. And I understand like, it's a practice right but like do you recommend getting to the point where you're just like not masturbating not having sex and just always putting you know like or is it like a balance where see right? see what happens yeah if you if you if you if you try for 90 days what just not masturbate not have and sex for 90 just days see what but see what happens okay. it, 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 because everybody's makeup is different yeah but if you try it's like spaghetti on the wall my thing, there's people that like, they feel fully expressive when they curse. I don't curse anymore because my container does not resonate with those words. It's something I tried. My body doesn't like it. I tried for two weeks once. Like it didn't last five days. <laughs> two weeks. <laughs> yeah, but maybe 90 days would be a bigger so it, challenge. So it must know? not have been important to you. For sure, yeah. Yeah, when something is really, mm -hmm. really important, so yeah. maybe find a deeper reason. And if the and if the reason is like, man, I didn't last, must not have been a deeper reason because I used to make excuses about something all the time. But then, when I was doing this for my mom and I was doing this for my daughter and I wanted to retire my mom because I got sick and tired of her working a nine to five job to call another man or woman a boss to get paid less than her value for the last 30 something years what's that worth to me so every time i wanted to give in to something that wasn't supporting me and moving forward towards my goal i would put an image of my mom on the table in front of me and say hey mom you're not worth it maybe that might help i don't know because I don't know your life, but I know what gets me. I know what gets me. I'm a mama's boy through and through. So if I say, hey, mom, while she's dying at her job, oh, baby, I'm only staying here because I got insurance. But the reason why she goes to the doctor is from the stress that she got at her nine to five job. So basically she was working to kill herself. That doesn't sit well on my soul. And if I could do something about it, I'm going to do everything I can so that I can get there much quicker. That matters to me. So find what matters to you. Attach that as an anchor and have, make you find an accountability partner or some w way to have something right in front of gotcha, your face. Andy. 
something right in front of your face. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's great, man. I mean, I, I feel like recently I've just, uh, like, because things always work out perfectly for me, you know, and I just, that's kind of, I'm just lucky, I guess. And I feel like that's made me a little bit kind of like not playing at the level that I could be, you know? So I feel like I'm really in a place right now where I'm ready to just go all in, you know? And all in on what? Well, like you get one a specific thing. Like, yeah. Yeah. So my drum drumming career is a big thing for me. I've, you know, I know, I know the strategy. I have it in my head. I'm implementing it, but putting all my Do eggs you have it in your heart. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. For sure. Yeah. I'm my goal. My whole life has been to find a band that I'm going to put all my effort and all my eggs into. And, um, you know, I've traveled to like three different countries in the last five years to find it. And, you know, I'm still looking. <laughs> So I, I, I've been committed. I've been putting in the work. Did you level. find it in your heart? See I, I that pause? So. I believe Wait, so. hold on. Yeah. See that pause? I, there's a pause there for sure, yeah. So, you know, you could be right. There, there's probably a deeper reason that I haven't found yet. But I've taken so much time to, like, find that reason. And I feel like, oh, I found it. It's cool. But, you know, maybe there's a deeper level, you know? Who, who knows? Jit there was a pause when yeah. i asked you did you find it in your heart and there's a reason why i asked that right yeah because <laughs> a lot of things that i'm hearing from you sounds very heady all up in here i know when somebody's talking from their heart i'd say really check in from here really play from here and what comes from the heart goes into the heart and what comes from the heart will always find a home it will find a home. You don't have to look for it. You won't have to look for it when you're coming from here. When you're coming from here, I was like, man, I'm going to travel here and I'm going to go here. and I'm yeah. Give this a shot because it's one of the most powerful frequencies in the world. So I don't need to do any kind of journaling exercises. I just need to start maybe listening. Well, I mean, if the journaling like, exercises get you back to here. Yeah, maybe they haven't been doing that, you know. So I don't know. Just it, would you give any specific? I'm sorry to take up everyone's time, by the way. But no, yeah. <laughs> raise your hand if you're getting anything from what he's you, you get anything? sharing. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So it's so. not just you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you represent everybody in this room, including myself. Awesome. Love it. Yeah. I'm just like, how do I get to that that heart space then? Because I've felt many times that I found it, and I've done all of these, you know, exercises that you know coaches mentors tell you to do like the five whys and stuff like that like really you know asking questions getting deep um, i'm gonna ask you a question now hell yeah i got i got an answer for you what is something what is something that you used to do when you were five years old that made you the absolute happiest that you no longer do anymore i actually still do that thing what is that running around in my underwear <laughs> okay <laughs> what else uh i guess uh dressing up in uh like spider-man superman costumes i know he's a boring superman but you know. okay so what was it about spider-man superman costumes that you love um it's a good question um i guess just like the like the ability to be someone that you're you, you know stepping into a different character you know a bit living in a fantasy you know getting to try uh something that you know you're not usually doing if that makes sense so when you're stepping into a fantasy that brings you a lot of joy yeah i like adventure and uh sp spontaneity and the unknown that's what gets me pumped up okay so what would it be like if you stepped into the fantasy of your heart and you turn that into a character. What would it be like if I stepped into my heart? Sorry. Could you if you stepped into the fantasy of your heart, if your if your heart was a superhero. Yeah. You asking me what my inner superhero is? So if your your heart was a yeah. superhero. Yeah. And it could be a character. Uh huh. And you could step into that fantasy because right now everything that that you're sharing yeah. is coming from here. Okay, we can all hear it. It's all coming from the head. Yeah, here has a different resonance to it. it has a different grit to it. Has a different feeling to it. 
So if you could journey into your heart, I'm going to ask you another question. What is something else that you did when you were a little kid? like five years old does it have to be five or five six seven eight okay. when you were a little yeah. kid and it just brought you so much joy i don't know man i can't i can't remember too much um why i don't know i can't remember before 10 much why i guess uh it's pretty pretty insecure kid you know kind of feared a lot and uh didn't really insecure about what uh i think you know one thing i'm realizing a lot now is just um you know thinking you, you know the the not feeling worthy feeling like a loser feeling like you're you know not a part of something feeling like you're a little bit isolated. who is a person when you think about not being a part of something that that shows up in your mind that made you feel like that when you're a little my, kid. My dad, for sure, yeah. Your dad. My, my both my dads. I grew up with my stepdad. My dad was there for a little bit, but was in a different country. But like they both synergistically played a part in that. Played a part in what? In the narrative of me not feeling good enough. Yeah, because it was weird. My uh, dad was very fear based, and he just you know left when i was six to another country and you know that i think i definitely labeled myself as not worthy at that point when he left yeah. you told yourself what uh you know um i'm not good enough uh you know like, did you feel abandoned yeah for sure for sure yeah and tell me about the other guy so my stepdad, I think he was, he's a really great guy, but like he just stepped away from being a dad so much because he didn't want to get in the way of my real dad. But I needed a dad and my dad was in a different country. So I always was trying to get his approval, but he wouldn't, he, he's a very, you know, serious, key, you know, New Zealander that's just a man's man. He doesn't really show emotions in general, but even less so because he didn't want to be, he didn't want to step in as the father figure. So it was always like, well, my real dad abandoned me and then my stepdad, who I want to treat me as a son, won't do it because, you know, he's trying not to kind of thing. So what did you want more than anything in the world? Dad, for sure. Yeah. What does dad mean? Uh, just means like support, you know, um, means uh, having love and acceptance and just someone to have fun with you know go on adventures with like the times that i did spend with my dad when he was around was were like really fun but he wasn't there most of the time and he let me down in a lot of other other ways so it was like you know i had the fun dad the supportive dad when he was there but then the rest of the time i didn't have the the support you know and the the you know attention that i needed from my dad do me a favor and close your eyes. All right. What age was he? Was your dad when he left? Six. Hmm. I want you to take yourself back to when you were six years old. And the moment your dad left. And I want you to feel, allow yourself and try to feel those feelings that you felt. And in a second, I want you to open your eyes and I want you to look at me as if I were your dad, but from the eyes of that six-year-old. And I want you to tell me everything you wanted to tell him. Open your eyes. Dad, I need you. Uh, you're not looking at me, son. <laughs> uh, Dad, I need you. Um, I'm scared. Would it be all mon monotone like that? No. 
six. Dad's leaving. He's right here. Dad, why are you leaving? I need you to stay with me right now. I'm, I don't know when I'm going to see you again. I... I don't understand why you're leaving. Why, why? I don't think he can hear you or feel you. Oh yeah, I'm going there. Yeah, <laughs> you're going there. <laughs> this is your moment, homie. Right now. You're literally at the blue line of your life and the bridge of what has you blocked off from actually connecting with women, connecting with yourself, and connecting with everything else in the world. That's why everything comes from here, and this part is blocked off. Right there. It's because that little six-year-old has never expressed himself the way he really wanted to express himself. So the sexual energy cannot even fulfill its capacity because it's being blocked off just like a dam in a sewer. And your moments right now. Dad's right here. No one else is here. What do you really want to say? Say it how you really want to say it from the eyes and heart of that six-year-old. It's hard. I can't feel anything. I know. <laughs> like I want to fake it right now, and I could fake it, but I can't feel anything. Well, at least now we know why it's so hard for you to connect with women why it's so hard for you to connect period and why everything comes from here but i've gone through this experience so many times and i've healed it well but let like, me tell you something how, wh how do I you can brush your teeth yeah. every day for five years stop for five days and see what your breath smells like <laughs> right. the work is forever homie for sure i get that Look at your body movement. Look, look, just look at your closed, off, hardened. No woman, I'm telling you now, no woman who knows herself will ever connect to that because she wants you to experience the well and the ocean of her emotions. It takes someone who can hold the capacity So, if that's something you want, there's something that you're, you're actually blocking off from allowing the essence of your own self to feel. And the outside becomes a manifestation of what's going on inside. Blocked off, closed off, no feel. So you can do all this stuff around. But wherever you go, there you are. You can't hide from yourself. You can go to Pluto. You're going to meet a Martian that's going to literally reflect your work. Shit. Thank you, Andy. Yeah, it's great, man. Thanks, Garen. Appreciate it. Yeah. Anybody else like to share? All right, got a question? Anything else come up? 
Chris. Uh, so Gary. Hi, brother. There's a brother in my life you know about. Um, I've mentioned him before. He's been at your house. And it's funny. He told me... <laughs> he told me two days ago he wants to go to California. And I wonder where he got that from. Um, but he doesn't believe... He, he reads your story. I gave him your book. He reads your story. And he wants to believe that he can be like you. And I believe he can. I believe he has a, a beautiful story that needs redemption. Um, and he, he's, he's blocked in a lot of ways. And I think about him often knowing you and reading your book and, and all of that and I, I see so much see many, so many parallels my question is how does somebody look at your life and look at all your successes and hear all your words and do their best to just really embody and integrate all of the teachings and believe that they can have it too because it's, from what, from my perspective, kind of watching it, from my my view, my purview. It, it seems like it's a it's a caveat that so many people that read your book are like, I want to believe that this is for me, but how how do I? Other than just applying the principles, applying the teachings, applying, like, I want to live from my heart, not from my head. All of these things. What would you say to somebody? You know what I'm talking about that doesn't believe that they have a life that they can they can live their best life the way that you have yeah yeah so one I'm, I'm i'm not here to save people but i'm here to lead people in discovering themselves the best way i know how and i'm sure there's many other ways is by personal example I can't teach somebody how to believe in themselves. I've always believed in myself. I just never knew where to put the energy. I believe I can get this girl. I believe I can be varsity as a freshman. I believe, I believe, I believe. That has always been, that's always been inside of me. One day, I'm going to be on stage. There's going to be 50,000 people. I don't know how it's going to be. But right before COVID happened, I was in, New, I was in Mexico City. 49,000 people. Crazy. Completely sold out. I can't teach that. It's just one of those things where I'm not going to say either you have it or you don't. But if you stay around the fire for long enough, maybe you'll start to remember you for real. You know, me... It was community for me. I, all of this stuff that I've done, I did not do this by myself. I was around people that were modeling a way. I would see examples. I'm like, man, I want to make $20,000 a month. I want to make $100,000 a month. I want to make $250,000 a month. And then when it happened, I'm like, oh, this because I was inspired by this person. And what was he doing? He read this book. So I'm going to read this book. He sold his shoes to go to this seminar. I sold CDs and DVDs plus some shoes at Buffalo Exchange to go to a seminar. That was $50. But when I went to the seminar, I met some more people. I was like, wow. These people talk like Napoleon Hill. These people talk like John C. Maxwell. That guy reminds me of Eric Thomas. And I just kept coming around and coming around. And flowers th that grow together grow much faster than they do by themselves. At no point did I do it by myself. And at no point did Michael Jordan win a championship by himself. So my thing is, if you don't believe you can do it, I don't know what to tell you. 
but I'm going to keep living by example. And those who do believe, which I have plenty of testimonies, plenty of people who live worse lives than I did. My father was murdered by two men. I had a standing ovation in front of some guy and in front of somebody. By the time I was done, it was like a, a crowd of 5,000 people. I got off this, the speaking engagement stage and this guy was lasering. He just kept looking at me. Was, What's wrong with this dude? And he comes up to me in tears and he said, I want to apologize. I said, for what? He said, I want to apologize on behalf of the two men who murdered your father. 20 years ago, I murdered somebody. It wasn't my father, but 20 years ago, I murdered somebody. And I just got out of prison yesterday. And I was going to murder the person who snitched on me. But then I saw what freedom looked like on stage. So I'm letting you know. I'm not going to touch him and I'm going to change my life because I saw, I saw in you what I wanted for my life. And I got closure because I never got closure from the two men who murdered my father. And he relayed that closure by me being the example. So maybe it didn't work for somebody else, but I got person after person after person after person who it did work for and that's how I know how to show up in the world by being the best example and keeping people and reminding people and inspiring people to stay around the fire of the environment that they want to live into Amazing. Let's uh, let's take one more if we got one. Anybody? Thomas. Nike. Uh, no. Ron. I was about to say I got that same shirt at home. Cool. It's Roan. So you mentioned uh, being crushed and being a wimp. What do you do in times when you're crushed and you feel like a wimp and you feel like, you know, this thing you're building maybe isn't real? How do you work with that? Well, I'm fortunate to have a very extraordinary wife so I can bounce ideas off of her. The other day I felt crushed. <clears throat> Even with this bulletproof mindset of mine, I still have my moments. I'm in momentum. Everything's going crazy with me at 42 with my sex drive, with my health, with my money, with bit everything. We just had a beautiful baby. All of a sudden, I go to fight club and I knee a kicking bag. I'm not even fighting. I knee a kicking bag and step on my ankle wrong and I snap my calf in half. And now I'm like, I got all this momentum. The next day, I was a mess. And I'm just sitting in bed. I'm like, oh, I'm crying. I'm like, oh, my God. I was like, man, so much momentum. And my wife goes, hey, put this outfit on. Get out of bed. Get your crutches. I'm going to bring weights on. You can sit down right here. You got this, baby. I believe in you. And I was like, oh, my God. That's right. So having accountability is huge. My wife is the, my greatest accountability partner. And I just like, baby, I need you to put on freaking accountability hat. That's it. We have different hats. There's like my, my sex partner hat. There's business hat. There's accountability hat. There's my best friend hat. And I need to preface context even when i'm talking with a friend i need you to put on this hat i need a friend i don't want to be spiritual i don't want to be personally developed i just want to say it straight up unedited how i really feel and i just need you to be a, a, an open door to hold space for everything that's about to come out blah 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 blah, blah. and i don't like this and i don't like that now, blah, 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 blah. and my wife is like 
would you like for me to share anything? Yes, I need Coach Hat. So knowing what you want and knowing how to tell people how to hold space for you is the biggest thing. Doing it by yourself is hard. You know, and pride as men, they're like, oh, man, who are you going to tell? That's why it's really good to have a brotherhood. I'm so grateful to have that because the men in my life, the, when I lean into them, they meet certain needs. I used to try to make my wife meet those needs. She can't be anything in all things at all times. That's where our marriage was the hardest. So just like other friends, we try to make them any and all things. It's like sometimes this person may be the person that you're just like, hey, I know you can hold a lot of space right now. I'm not feeling at my best and I need to share something with you that I'm really feeling. I don't want judgment or feedback or anything. I just need somebody to be there for me. Right now, I feel worthless. I feel useless. I feel like a wimp. I feel crushed. And I just need support getting, getting my mojo back. And I think you being honest and finding a trusted source that you could speak to and like really allowing that part of you to be expressed. Because honestly, it's a part of you. So it wants to be loved too instead of suppressed. That would support you being fully embodied in it and it will grow that aspect of you. Thank you. That's, that's really powerful. Uh, would you say that vulnerable aspect of when you're working with the people you coach, is that what allows you to kind of um, connect with them more? So like, for example, even in this setting, what if you felt that kind of wimp thought coming on and I'll just use a personal example I train people um, and sometimes I feel like a fraud and sometimes I feel like all the studies that I've done and all the sessions that I've put other people through and myself through are not good enough um, and I feel like I'm hiding behind something uh, do you personally just express that vulnerability to them and say you know what I feel like maybe I'm teaching you something I shouldn't teach you right now because I don't know it enough how do you how do you deal with that well you one know, i don't ever i don't teach that. anything that i don't have personal experience from mm -hmm. i don't teach theory at all okay. everything i said tonight everything i talk about i actually have a personal result and i've coached people to achieving extraordinary results so it's been tried tested and true when something is tried tested and true your body knows your subconscious body so when it's not tried, tested, and true, and you're operating from theory, now you're in your head, not in your heart. That's what creates that, uh, I feel like I'm being a fraud, because your body is like, hey. And there's nothing wrong with not knowing it all. Let me tell you something. As a coach that gets paid, and I get paid a lot, especially for one-on-one -on -one sessions. Yo, somebody asked me something. I don't know. I was like, yo, I don't know about that, but I can refer you to this person. But I let them know. And one thing that people really love about me, I am so upfront. And I will tell you upfront. And I give you context about everything. When I know something, when, I, when I, I'm aware of something, you'll hear the heart. You'll hear the passion. When I'm in my head, I'll be like, oh, well, uh, and I'll start stutter, stuttering and everything. And I feel like a fraud. So let me just continue to cultivate my skills. Like right now, you ask me anything about a spreadsheet or a PowerPoint. Oh my God. Like that's not my wheelhouse. When you ask me something about transformation or working with bringing people through a process and you know it's different when I'm right here it's different from here to here but when I'm right in your face and I'm understanding the frequencies around you and I'm clapping to distract from your negative thoughts that's stuff that it's like a grandmother who's been cooking for a long time doesn't really need the ingredients you kind of just allow yourself to be a channel and a conduit for the information that's desired for the moment that's a knowing that doesn't belong to me but it's a i allow myself to be used for the service of many and so my invitation to you is the stuff that you 
are passionate about, if you teach that, you will never, ever feel not confident. And the stuff that you're not aware of, try it with people. Hey, I'm trying this out. I'm looking into this. And find people who won't be a yes man or a yes woman or a yes person in your life. Be like, what would you think of that? Nah, didn't feel it. That's what I have. Anytime I'm trying something, I'm like, yo. They're like, nah. Again, again, again. And then I try it on people. I try it on other people. As soon as people start coming back re with results, I, I got a quality product. Seriously, thank you. Yep. Awesome. Well, I'm thank you, guys. You yeah. I mean, let's. anybody got anything that's you know brought up for them they want to share? It was a really good time. So. Come on, I know there's something. That's perfect. There's a lot of process. I know when a brain is processing. There's yeah. Like, yo. I can tell there's, there's thoughts. Uh, could you go deeper into that moment when you kind of had clarity on what your calling was exactly? And that process leading up to it of trial and error, of kind of grasping at egoic desires, and then finally coming to terms with, okay, yeah. this is actually what yeah. it is for me. So when I shared who I really was online and I was completely vulnerable and I got the message of I put the gun down when you shared your testimony. I knew that one of my biggest superpowers is being extremely vulnerable because most people I know are not. So I started to practice sharing my story and i just kept sharing my story and i share my story online every podcast i've ever done on impact theory or in forbes i shared my story and i just kept sharing my story in many different ways and that just kept bringing more and more people i was like man every time i open my mouth and share what i overcame i attract people who are overcoming things so this is my lane and I had to, people like, find your niche market. My niche market is vulnerability and teaching people how to be confident in, in embodying their own selves. That's my market. And it's so easy to see in everything that I do. So I didn't have to like research with my niche market. My niche market was when I showed up as the authentic expression of myself. And those people just started coming in because that's what I was sharing online. Anything you see on me, it's going to be something about a story or vulnerability or something. I don't have 10 steps to success, but I have 10 steps to deepen your heart. And once you have the gravity of that, oh man, I can point you in any direction. I can go right here. Now you're an embodied person that's going right there. People are going to respond to that because it's attractive to the, to the to the spiritual realm. When you open your heart, people love that. So I don't know if that answers your question, but that was the thing that had me. I didn't know exactly what it was, but I followed my intuition. Keep sharing your story. Just keep keep doing it keep doing it keep doing it next you know i shared my story and i'm on stage with gary v i'm on stage with eric thomas in the uk wait what oh okay i'm gonna keep sharing my story because every single time i do someone in the audience someone in the podcast they're like man that changed my life that's all i need that 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 verification is an outward expression of what I've accepted in myself. Yeah, I think um, that often what we pursue based on what we want or our ego wants is often things that we think or know that we can achieve as well. You know, like often the form of it, the ego itself is just a protective mechanism where we protect our identities and 
you know, make sure that we only pursue the things that we know that we can achieve or that will look good doing or whatever, you know, like fuck that. Like pursue some stuff that will chew you up and spit you out. You'll come out way better, you know, every time. And, um, you know, I think the biggest thing for me in doing that is like Garen said, you know, be aware of your momentum, always try to be falling forward, but don't be afraid to, to fail, you know, come up short, be chewed up, spit out. Like as long as you can keep moving forward, you're going to you're gonna do some amazing things in this life for sure. These beautiful faces out there. Y'all can't see out there, but I can see. <laughs> I'm talking about the people who are probably like listening on only audio. <laughs> All right. Anybody else? Now's your chance. All right, guys. Well, thank you, Garen. Really appreciate you coming out tonight, man. It was, it was epic. Yeah, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your life. And now you got a baby at home, and congrats again. Thank you so and, much. And uh, really excited to see you continue to expand and helping people along the way. And, you know, it's just it's formats like this that I think really inspire that, that next generation of, of coaches and people that are out there, you know. I think uh, something that, I want to say earlier about you know the things that you see or witness in life how they come up again and again and you apply them in coaching I always noticed that in training when I was personal training I'd always get random injuries like I'd tear a calf or something you know and pun intended and then, yeah and then uh cat. and you know maybe two months later I'd get a client I'd come in with like a calf issue or something and often we're we're uh you know, exactly the right place at the right time to experience things. And, and um, you know, I think there's going to be ways that y'all can implement this yourself or calls to action or friends that come to you with things that you've heard tonight or, you know, Thomas, let's grab lunch next week. I want to hear what's on your mind. Let's just continue to, to uh, you know, help each other expand and keep showing up and keep pursuing more uh, wisdom and knowledge and listening. So, big man, love. Thank man. you so much, yeah, bro. I, I appreciate it. Yeah. All right, guys. And then the yeah, appreciate you guys. Let's give it up.